Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going back to the 1941 film called They Died with Their Boots On, about the life and military career of General George Armstrong Custer. To help us separate fact from fiction in the movie, we'll be chatting with Professor Gregory J.W. Irwin from Temple University. Gregory is an author and historian who has written extensively about military history, including a book all about Custer called Custer Victorious, the Civil War Battles of General George Armstrong Custer. Before we connect with Gregory, though, let's set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is an all-out lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one. Custer's promotion to general during the Civil War came as a surprise. Number two, Custer was not a model student at West Point. Number three, Custer commanded the 7th Cavalry during the Civil War. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and by a simple process of elimination, you'll know which one is a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to chat with Gregory J.W. Irwin about the historical accuracy of They Died With Their Boots On. Let's start with an overall look at the movie. If you were to give this movie a letter grade on how well it told Custer's story, what would it get? Well, if you were to ask that question to George Armstrong Custer, or better yet, his wife, Elizabeth Bacon Custer, who after his death became his chief uh, PR aide, they would say, A, uh, as a historian who's willing to give Hollywood a certain amount of leeway uh, in dealing with the past, I, I give it a C, primarily because no other screen Custer has done a better job of capturing Custer's more attractive qualities than Arrow Flynn, his charisma, his charm. His ability to ride a horse well. <laughs> some some movie Custer's look like a sack of potatoes uh, on the back of a horse. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, but there there there's an awful lot of uh, of uh, telescoping because you're you're covering something like 19 years from 1857 to 1876, and there's an awful lot of fabrication too. Uh, a lot of facts get sacrificed to tell a fun story. Well, I, I, we're accustomed to that with movies, <laughs> but at, at least, at least, you know, it, this one, it sounds like it captured his ability to ride a horse, at least what you would expect for the cavalry. <laughs> exactly. Flynn Custer was, was a dashing uh, person. Uh, he knew how to inspire men in combat, especially during the civil war. And Flynn exudes that aura. Well, you, you mentioned the date of 1857 and that is when the movie starts as uh Custer joins West Point. Can you give us an overview of George Custer's life leading up to the point at which we see him in the movie's timeline? Sure. He was born in uh, 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 in New Rumley, Ohio. Uh, that's a town near present-day Steubenville. It's now in the middle of fracking country. Uh, on December 5th, 1839, he was the... Uh, Eldest son, uh, eldest child of a second marriage. His father, Emmanuel, was a widower, and his mother, Maria Ward Kirkpatrick, uh, was was a widow. Uh, so uh, he's born into a family already with a bunch of, of half-brothers and half-sisters, and then uh, his parents, in addition to him, they sire uh, three other boys uh, and a girl. Uh, Emmanuel is, is, a, is a blacksmith. Um, which is a skilled job, but he's not very wealthy. Um, he uh, is best known for being something of a big mouth. He's an outspoken uh, Jacksonian Democrat uh, and likes to get into political debates uh, at a time when, when politics were as, as rollicking and sometimes as vicious as our own day. Um, and uh, after a half-sister uh, marries a fellow living uh, in the town of Monroe, Michigan, which was a prospering uh, Lake Erie port. Uh, uh, George, or Audie, as his family called him, uh, they send him there uh, because the schools are better. 
So they're looking to give him a better a better crack at life. Uh, so he he gets uh, uh, an event. Well, I don't know if you'd say a better education because he wasn't all that bookish, <laughs> but he's he's exposed to uh, uh, say uh, some of the higher things in, in life that you wouldn't have found in uh, in uh, New Rumley, Ohio. Would that be an example of the the phrase, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink? At least they're going to try to give him a good education, even if he's not that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Some of it rubbed off. Uh, the fact that he went to West Point uh, indicates that he uh, he was uh, looking to advance uh, himself because most Americans didn't go to college back then. Um, and the uh, uh, U.S. Military Academy uh, was a good engineering school, so at, at the very least, uh, even if you uh, you couldn't um, uh, make a good career in the army, you might be able to find work uh, in a country that was you know, you know moving uh, now uh, uh, with a vengeance into the into the industrial revolution. Um, but uh, there are two stories about how he got into West Point. Uh, one was that he uh, uh, developed a, a relationship with a young woman named Mary Holland who came from the better side of town. And her father uh, looked uh, with alarm on this burgeoning relationship and wanted to get Custer out of the neighborhood. So he put pressure on the local Republican Congressman, John A. Bingham, to get Custer an appointment to West Point. The other story is that Custer himself uh, applied to Bingham, which probably sounds more likely. And, and in the uh, second half of the 1850s, Republic, Republican Party's brand new. You know, it's born in 1854, 1856. Uh, and it's pulling in a lot of different Northerners uh, from uh, uh, diverse political backgrounds, people who are, are now angry at the South over the spread of slavery. And so you've got Democrats and you've got Whigs and you've got a political abolitionist joining this coalition. And uh, Bingham may have thought, well, this is a way to get, uh, get the Custer family into our coalition. So uh, one way or the other, uh, Custer gets gets that appointment to West Point, and that is a major turning point in his life because it, it opens doors uh, for him and, and opens his eyes to new possibilities about what he can make of his life. I do like the story of just trying to get rid of him. <laughs> and so to do that, we're going to send him, <laughs> get him to go to West Point. <laughs> Stranger things can happen, and maybe, maybe both... Uh, both uh, uh, forces were at work. Well, once he does get into West Point, according to the movie, we see uh, there's a long list of delinquencies. <laughs> One of the men actually remarks that Custer is going to make the worst or have the worst record of any cadet at West Point since Ulysses S. Grant. And then, at least according to the movie, he fulfills that prediction of having a terrible record. <laughs> but uh, he still manages to graduate, even though he's the last of his class to graduate. And he's assigned to the Second Cavalry. How was customer, uh, Custer's time at West Point? Well, that, that, that's a great question. And, and that is one part of the movie where they really adhere to historical accuracy, except for the slam on Grant. Grant graduated toward the center of his class. He wasn't a great student. Uh, he excelled uh, mainly at horsemanship, but, you know, he, he wasn't in danger of ever flunking out. Yeah, yeah, he's, but but Custer, Custer was. Um, according to one of his, his schoolmates, he said he, he, he had more fun and caused his friends more anxiety than every, any other cadet I've ever known. And, and that friend would later become a professor at West Point. So he knew a lot of cadets. Uh, Custer, you know, he, he, he wasn't dumb, but he, he told this same person, uh, Peter Mickey, he said there are only two places worth having in a class. Number one and the last, the rear, the goat, you know. Uh, and he wasn't really that inclined to work all that hard um, uh, to be number one. So he, he according to Mickey, he, he tried to uh, stay as close to the bottom as he could without being kicked out. Now, Custer would later say, well, you know, if the Civil War hadn't come along and if a lot of my Southern uh, classmates hadn't resigned to join the Confederacy, my class standing would have been a lot better. Uh, at the same time, he said, my career at West Point, you know, it's, uh, I w I'm not a role model. <laughs> Some generations should not follow. But he was a prankster. Uh, you know, he loved hazing underclassmen. Uh, he loved escapades. Uh, one time in Spanish class, 
uh, and he, you know, he, he plotted this with his classmates ahead of time. But he asked the professor, how do you say class is dismissed in Spanish? And the professor said said the words and the cadets bolted, you know, <laughs> something Custer had planned. Uh, so, uh, he, you know, he was getting in trouble, but at the same time, uh, the people who were, uh, uh, the officers, the technical officers who were scoring him with the Barretts, they liked him. Because he said, you know, this is the kind of, because uh, uh, they knew his, his classmates liked him and they'd follow him in these hijinks. And they said, this is the kind of leadership uh, capabilities we're looking for in young officers. Hopefully he'll mature. But, you know, he, he's got these tendencies. So uh, at least once it looked like he, he exceeded the number of demerits that would have uh, uh, resulted in his automatic uh, uh, expulsion. But somebody went into his record book and erased a bunch of them, you know, and, 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 and saved his bacon. Uh, so, but but he, he graduates last, uh, 34, in, in the class of, uh, of uh, June 1861, after the Civil War had broken out. Was he not just not that interested in the in the schooling side of it, and more on on the military side? Like you you mentioned, Grant, he was a good horseman. He was a people. Uh, he was a good swordsman. Um, he 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 read a bit. Uh, uh, more often, novels, romance novels about uh, cavaliers from the Napoleonic Wars and things like that. Uh, but you know, he just. It, it, he, he was he was he was kind of a class clown type of guy, you know. I, I would categ- categorize him more like that. But he did just you know, he he would reach a point where it looked like he was going to be expelled uh, for getting too many demerits, and he'd go weeks at a time without getting 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 uh, getting clipped. Uh, and the same thing with with his studies. You know, he'd reach a point. Oh, I got, I got to get a better grade on this on the next exam. And he, and he bring. So he just, he did, he did what he could to to stay in, but not to distinguish himself academically. Yeah, he, he was self aware. It sounds like he knew when he needed to hunker down and, and focus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it, in fact, afterwards, uh, and later in life, when he su- uh, became a success, writing magazine articles and wrote an autobiography. Um, after he died, uh, some of his classmates, when they wrote to his uh, his widow, they said, "We never thought he was that smart. <laughs> he could write a book." <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, never, uh, you know, never. Uh, um, just because someone doesn't get good grades uh, doesn't mean that that they uh, are bound for failure in life. And and. A number of people who've been successful in the military didn't, ex- you know, they weren't they weren't the top of the class academically, but they had other qualities like Dwight David Eisenhower that made them successful in later life. Yeah, I would say Eisenhower was rather successful in life. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned the date of uh, 1861, and according to the movie, the first action in the Civil War that we see Custer taking part in is on July 21st, 1861 at Manassas. And almost immediately, he does something that he shouldn't do when he knocks down his commanding officer and orders him his men to take a bridge. How well did the movie do showing Custer during the Manassas campaign? It's 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 exaggerated. The depiction of Custer at Bull Run is exaggerated. Now, uh, you know he graduates, uh, uh, I think June twenty June twenty fourth, eighteen sixty one. Uh, he goes to New York, orders a uniform, uh, buys a saber uh, and a revolver and the other officer equipment, heads down to Washington, and he's assigned to a company, the Second Cavalry, which is part of the army that's going to try to capture Richmond, which is going to march on Bull Run. Um, you know, it's his first battle, and, and, and his uh, Civil War memoirs, which he, he was writing bef- uh, at the time of his death, he just, you know, I was there <laughs> and watched this. And wondered if we got into action, if I should use a saber or a pistol. But he doesn't talk about uh, knocking out a squadron command or performing any feats of daring do. Uh, Congressman Bingham, who uh, got him into West Point, would later claim that uh, when the Union forces were retreating, uh, a wagon got upset on a bridge uh, and troops began panicking because they had visions of rebel cavalry coming down on top of them and that Custer stepped in and restored order. And and he may have done that, uh, but uh, you know that, that, that punching out a, pun, punching out a, a superior officer on the battlefield <laughs> uh, only in Hollywood could you get away. 
<laughs> I was going to say there's demerits in uh, in West Point, but I I think that that might be something that you would not be able to come back from. <laughs> Well, there is a scene in the movie where Major Romulus Tape is writing a letter to Custer to reprimand him, but then Lieutenant General Scott walks in, and upon the news that Confederate General Lee is near Gettysburg, Scott orders Tape to dictate a letter to appoint a new Brigadier General to command the Michigan Brigade. And that letter gets written down on the it's interesting the way the movie shows it. It gets written down on the paper that was originally addressed to Custer at top where they're going to reprimand him. And then at the, the bottom in the letter is this, you know, oh, you're appointed to being a brigadier general. And the impression I got here was that it was both rushed, a mistake, and a complete surprise to Custer himself. Is that true? Custer's promotion from first lieutenant to brigadier general at the end of June 1863 uh, came as a surprise to most of the rest of the army and, and probably to him, but it wasn't an accident. Uh, after Bull Run, uh, he, you know, he's a West Pointer, and even a, a, a West Pointer with a poorly ingested military education, he's been trained to be a soldier for four years, and he's part of an army of amateurs, all these civilians who have been recruited. I mean, during the first year of the war, the Union Army went from 16,000 men to more than 600,000. So having uh, you know, officers uh, with any kind of, of, of training, uh, well, they were at a premium. And so he starts getting uh, assigned to uh, various staff positions. And by the spring of 1862, he is assigned to the staff of the most uh, powerful soldier in the Union Army, Major General George B. McClellan, who commands the Army of the Potomac. That was the North's largest field army. And uh, McClellan loves Custer. He says, this guy, his head was always clear in danger. He always brought me accurate reports. I could count on him for anything. And uh, Custer, you know, goes from being the goat of his class, you know, the Charlie Brown of West Point, to uh, someone sitting on, on the footstool at the center of power, and he's he's getting uh, he's making connections, he's networking, uh, as as uh, as we say today. And and you know the, the command, uh, even though most officers aren't West Pointers, they're they're fresh from civilian life. The senior command, these are West Pointers. They look out for each other, and they look out for for their for their you know for their uh, younger uh, uh, younger associates. And uh, McClellan, uh, uh, you know, he he, uh, it's funny, uh, Custer idolized him. He said he'd die for him. And this is a, an officer who uh, was always looking for a fight. Uh, and he feels that way about a general who specialized in avoiding fights. <laughs> McClellan was extra cautious. Uh, but he serves with McClellan until McClellan's roof removed from command after Antietam in November 1862. And it looks like, oh, I got to go back and serve as a platoon commander. Uh, but then another uh, a general, uh, someone who's not as highly placed, Brigadier General Alfred Pleasanton, he commands a, a cavalry division. He asks Custer to serve on his staff. And a few months later, Pleasanton becomes commander of all the Union cavalry in the Army of the Potomac, the cavalry corps. So he's more important. But he likes Custer, too. It's kind of a father-son um, relationship. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, again, he finds Custer reliable. He, he can always trust him uh, to bring him clear intelligence. Uh, you know, back then, uh, they didn't have iPhones. If you wanted to uh, give an order uh, to uh, the commander of a, of a unit that was some distance away, you sent an aid, especially if you didn't have time to write down a long order. And the aid, you had to count on him to remember clearly what you rattled at him, you know, in some agitation. Uh, and Custer was good at that. Uh, and uh, Pleasanton, after he becomes commander of the Cavalry Corps, the way he got the job was he was something of a backstabber. Uh, and uh, once he is in the position of power, he doesn't want anyone stabbing him in the back. So he starts replacing brigade uh, commanders with people who are loyal to him. And George Armstrong Custer is part of that Pleasanton family. And Pleasanton, right after George Gordon Meade becomes commander of the Army of the Potomac in, in the middle of Lee's invasion of the North, Pleasanton says, I want to give this brigade to, to one of my aides, Custer. And Meade says, fine. And, and Custer gets a letter addressed to Brigadier General George Armstrong Custer, which, uh, according to his first biographer, uh, who uh, spoke to Libby extensively, uh, that took him by surprise. But but he he was very happy to accept the appointment. <laughs> I, I like the way the movie showed it, where uh, they were 
talking about General Custer and he's there. He's like, you know, don't make fun of me. And, you know, hey, don't call me General. Don't make fun of me. No, <laughs> like he thought the people were mocking him there. But no, yeah, you're General Custer. Supposedly he boasted, you know, before this war's over, I'll be a major or I'll be a general, that kind of thing. So people were always joshing him. And, and he thought he thought they were they were just, uh, you know, carrying on the joke. Uh, but uh, uh, and, and that might have happened again. That's that a, a, a variation on that story is in his uh, his first biography that, that appeared a few months after the Little Bighorn. Uh, but, uh, you know, as I say, he, he's the youngest general. In the Union Army at that time, he's 23 years old. Uh, some younger appointed later, but at that time, bam! And, and people say Custer. <laughs> if we go back to the movie, almost immediately after he's given the command, General Custer then defies the order to go to Round Top, just south of Gettysburg, and then they, they hear some gunshots in the distance, and he orders his men to ride to the sound of the guns in the distance. Uh, meanwhile, we find out that Jeb Stewart is attacking Hanover from a bit of paper that's dated, I think it was uh, June 30th, 1863. And according to the movie, it kind of sets us up that all that stands between them and disaster is this Michigan brigade. And then at this point, General Tape realizes that Custer's the one that's been made general, and and he's attacking Stewart at Hanover, and <laughs> this seems like disaster because you know Custer, you know, with all the demerits that he had in at West Point, we don't see a lot of the fighting in the movie itself, but we do see different regiments charging, being uh, repulsed, until finally the first Michigan managed to break through and force Stewart to retreat. In the, the end, Custer is named the hero of Hanover. How well did the movie do showing Custer's first command after being made general there? There's a tenuous connection to the truth uh, in those scenes. Uh, when Robert E. Lee began his in second invasion of the North, when he headed into Pennsylvania and landed up at Gettysburg, uh, Jeb Stewart, his cavalry commander, cut loose with three brigades to ride around the Union Army. He had done this before, got him a lot of newspaper uh, 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 praise. But it was also a good way of demoralizing the enemy and, and harming their logistics, etc. So Lee tells Stuart, yeah, you can go on this raid, but don't be gone long because Lee is moving in enemy territory. And he depends on Stuart for his intelligence. He depends on Stuart to know where the enemy is, what the enemy's planning to do, where the enemy's headed. So Stuart goes off on this raid, and at first it, it, it goes well. He captures a big wagon train full of supplies and starts heading back to join Lee. Uh, but uh, the Union Army has placed itself between Lee and Washington, D.C. So it means Stuart has to kind of circumvent the Union Army. And the Union Cavalry is out uh, doing what Cavalry is supposed to do, looking for the enemy and reporting to headquarters. and. Uh, the division Custer's in, the 3rd Cavalry Division, is doing that. And on June 30th, uh, 1863, uh, Pennsylvania Town Hall, Hanover, they bump into Stewart. Stewart bumps into them. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, they get in his way uh, and they fight a brisk, a brisk firefight. Uh, and then Stewart kind of swings north around the Union Cavalry and starts heading west to try to uh, rendezvous with Lee. So the, the fight at Hanover... Uh, it, it, it's it's a minor affair. Uh, Stewart uh, links up with Lee on the night of July 2nd. And the following day, Lee sends Stewart with four brigades to uh, menace the right flank of the Union Army at Gettysburg. Uh, Custer's division uh, had orders to move from the right flank to the left flank, to move south to Little Round Top. Uh, there were two brigades in Custer's division. Uh, the first had already moved out, and Custer's guys were encamped uh, on the right flank, uh, which was supposed to be guarded by the uh, Union 2nd uh, Cavalry Division under uh, Brigadier General David Gregg. Well, just as Custer's getting ready to, to ship out, uh, Jeb Stewart makes his appearance, and Gregg has two weak brigades. Stewart has 6,000 men. Gregg has something like 3,000 guys, and he says to Custer, I stay here. Uh, I'll disobey your orders to report to the left. I'll take responsibility. And Custer looks and says, that's where the enemy is. Yeah, I'll stay here. He had about 2,500 men in his brigade. So it's the biggest union unit on the field. And Greg puts him in the center. Uh, and then Stuart, you know, 
there are all kinds of theories about uh, what Stuart's intentions were, that he meant to, to outflank the Union Army and hit its rear in conjunction with Pickett's charge, uh, which would also be staged on, on, on the afternoon of July 3rd, 18, 1863, or he was just there to you know, create some mischief, distract the Federals. But, but you have a, a pretty large-scale cavalry action, and, and Custer, uh, he starts off, uh, he sends out one of his regiments which is armed with seven shots, Spencer repeating rifles. They're a novelty at this point as skirmishers and they drive the rebels back. But the trouble with repeaters is that you burn off your ammunition quickly. And so they're out of ammunition and the rebels start crowding them. And Custer puts himself in front of another regiment, the 7th Michigan, and leads a charge and drives the rebels back until they come over a rise and they slam into a, into a, a stone wall with a rail fence on top of it. And the rebels are on the other side, firing into the Federals, emptying saddles. So Custer has to retreat. And then uh, about half of Stuart's uh, force, maybe a little less than that, about 2,000 guys, uh, come out uh, mounted to uh, fight their way through the Union Center. Custer has two regiments now that have been dispersed. He has another one guarding his artillery. That leaves him just one smaller regiment, the 1st Michigan Cavalry, 500 men. And as the rebels come down, he says, well, there's nothing else to do. And he charges them head on. Uh, in fact, just before his regiment makes contact with this rebel mass, he spurs his horse so that all the Union troopers can see him. And just before he disappears among the rebels, he yells, uh, um, 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 come on, you Wolverines, uh, appealing to local pride. And, and they give a shout and follow him in. And they stymie the Confederates, the impetuosity at charge. Uh, by that time, some of Custer's other uh, dispersed troopers have gotten to the horses and they're hitting the rebels on the flanks. Uh, some elements from one of Gregg's brigades hit the rebels on the flanks. And so it's like this freight train is coming down and then it just it stops and it wavers and the rebels end up melting away. Uh, and the Federals win the day. And they weren't used to forcing the Confederates to retreat. Uh, but Custer, you know, plays an important role in that. And, and that's the beginning of, of his uh, rise to uh, uh, national hero status. Uh, his men, I'm sorry, his men are delighted. They say, wow, this is great. You know, this, this guy, uh, I mean, it's just like, at first, they don't know who he is. Uh, this is another damn West Porter put it. And then they're saying, Anything he does, he succeeds. And we're so glad. Uh, uh, during the, Lee's retreat for, from uh, Gettysburg on the last day, Custer uh, leads his troops against Lee's rear guard and they take a number of prisoners. And one fellow who's in his, in his escort writes home, I saw General Custer plunge his saber in the belly of a rebel who was trying to kill him. You can guess how soldiers fight for such a general. You know, so he, he, he charms them with his personal courage and the fact that he looks to be a winner. They like that too. Well, you mentioned the charge, and, and the way the movie kind of portrays it, the impression I got was Custer was supposed to play more of a defensive role, but then he charges, and that's almost, again, seems to imply that he's he's not necessarily straight up breaking orders in this case, that was the impression I got, but more like just not, maybe not the best military strategy. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the movie... Makes puts him in complete charge. There's no other federal troops there. He's serving under General Gregg. Initially, he's fighting defensively. He's got dismounted skirmishers, uh, and then when when that skirmish line gets in trouble, then he, he charges with the Seventh Michigan. And then when the rebels they come out to make a charge, then he will counter charge because he's got nothing else. Uh, you know, there they was the only regiment available, uh, and uh, it, it was it was a gamble. I mean, it could have been Custer's last stand right there. It, Charge hadn't been successful, uh, but uh, but but it worked out. It worked out. So yeah, the movie the movie kind of fudges things. The movie doesn't actually show a lot of General Custer's time during the Civil War. After this, we do see a montage of what I'm assuming. The movie doesn't really explain this, but what I'm assuming is these are the battles that Custer fought during the Civil War. There's text on the screen, you know, Monterey Gap, Yellow Tavern, Woodstock, Winchester, and Cedar Creek. And we see Lee surrendering and the end of the war. 
Can you share an overview of General Custer's campaigns during the Civil War? After Gettysburg, as I mentioned, Custer is prominent in, in pursuing Lee's retreating army. And then in the rest of that summer, as the uh, Union Army of the Potomac and, and the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia under Robert E. Lee maneuver against each other, uh, the cavalry, you know, is between the infantry. Uh, and so Custer sees a lot of action uh, sparring with, with Jeb Stuart and other Confederate cavalry commanders. And he matures as a general. He, he uh, becomes more versatile tactically and uh, um, does, uh, well, he increasingly improves his performance. Uh, so he, you know, that reputation he makes at Gettysburg gets, gets burnished. In early 1864, there's a shakeup in the Army of the Potomac. Uh, a general from the West, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, is made commanding general of all the Union armies, and he decides he's going to personally supervise the campaign against Lee. Uh, he gets rid of General Pleasanton, the commander of the Army of the Potomac's Cavalry, and installs one of his pets, a general named Philip Sheridan, uh, in command of the cavalry. This is really the first time Custer beats Sheridan. Uh, Sheridan was in the class of 1853. He wasn't superintendent of the military academy. He would have been the last guy to be superintendent of the military academy. He was a hot-blooded Irishman. And um, he got upset with a, with a, uh, a superior uh, cadet, a southerner, who was giving a hard time on the drill field and lunged at him with his bayonet and was given a year's suspension. <laughs> so instead of graduating in 52, he graduated in 53. And he's a, he's a, uh, a forgotten captain in, in the Pacific Northwest when the Civil War breaks out. But once the war um, explodes, he's serving in, in the Western Theater in, in Kentucky and Tennessee, and he, his rise is, 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 is pretty, uh, uh, well, it's, it's meteoric, uh, to say the least. Uh, but he's in charge of the cavalry. This is a guy, you know, he's hard-headed. He wants results. He will not tolerate anyone who fails to bring them. And Custer, you know, is, you want me to jump? How high? You know, you got a dangerous mission? Give it to me and my Wolverines, that kind of thing. And uh, so uh, one of the first things that uh, Sheridan wants to do is cripple the Confederate cavalry. So he raids uh, Richmond, Virginia, hoping to draw Jeb Stuart away from Robert E. Lee's army. This is in May of 1864. And at the Battle of Yellow Tavern, Custer leads the uh, charge that kills Stuart. Uh, and he's prominent in other, other uh, 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 fights. Um, uh, in and around Richmond um, in, in August of 1864, Sheridan's put in charge of Union forces in the Shenandoah Valley, which has long been a, a thorn uh, in the Union High Command's uh, uh, a neck. Uh, uh, it was a place that the rebels used as an invasion corridor to repeatedly threaten Washington. And Custer reaches his apex as a soldier uh, in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, leads a cavalry charge that, that turns the rebel left flank, entrenched infantry at the Battle of Winchester. Cavalry rarely charged unbroken infantry. Uh, but Custer does that, and Sheridan is, is just so delighted, he gives him the command of the division, uh, the 3rd Cavalry Division, which Custer will turn into the best cavalry formation in the Union Army. Um, there are other victories in the Shenandoah, uh, the Confederate surprise, Sheridan at, at Cedar Creek. Custer helps to stem uh, the Union retreat there and then leads an attack that helps to break open the Confederate line and causes the rebels to, to flee. Um, Sheridan will, will come out of the Shenandoah in early 1665 and join Grant in front of Richmond and uh, destroy a big chunk of Lee's army at a place called Five Forks. Once again, Custer is prominent there. And uh, when Lee abandons Richmond and tries to flee west, to get away from Grant and try and link up with Confederate forces in North Carolina. Uh, Custer uh, is one of the point men in Sheridan's uh, uh, pursuit, helps to cut Lee's army in half at Sailor's Creek on April 6, 1865. And two days later, Lee is, is, is racing to reach a place called Appomattox Station, where trains are parked full of food for his famished army. Custer gets there first. Custer throws himself in front of Lee, checks Lee's retreat. The next morning when, when Lee wakes up, there are tons of Yankees in front of him. You know, but Custer was the guy that pinched him off. Uh, and uh, uh, Lee will surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. Um, after the surrender, Phil Sheridan, uh, I think, gave $20 in gold to William McLean 
for the table on which Grant had written the surrender terms for the Confederate Army. And he said, here, Custer, this is for you. He wrote, well, it's for your wife. And he wrote a note saying, that, you know, uh, I, this is a present that I give you out of appreciation for the services of your gallant husband. No one did more to bring, bring this about. Uh, he, he would say to Custer during the Civil War, Custer, you're the only man who never failed me. So, you know, the movie shows that a kind of a father-son relationship, this older guy who sees some potential in this unruly cadet. But in actuality, it was it was a, it was a uh, it was a, a combat partnership. Sheridan, here's a dirty job. Custer, get this dirty job done. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned never failing, and and the impression that I got from the movie, and even from what you were saying there, is Custer was perfectly okay and, and seemed to enjoy taking a risk, but. Uh, did they always work? <laughs> I mean, it seemed like he was a war lover. He was he was a, he was a war lover. Uh, uh, he, he wrote uh, uh, when I think of the charges that were made, I cannot, cannot exclaim, but glorious war. No, not always. There, there were you know the rebels weren't dumb. <laughs> they, they were a capable enemy. There were there were times when he would try something and they would check him. But part of the reason for his success was that he thought and moved quickly. He was a cavalry commander. Which is kind of like being a fighter pilot, you know. Oh, okay, they're on to me. I got to barrel roll out of here and then come around and, and try and try and, and try and catch them uh, from the flank or the rear. So yeah, yeah, there there, there were times when, when he uh, uh, got uh, you know uh, got got pushed back, but um, he he rebounded. He rebounded. Uh, he just had that gift for, it. And, and he had this tremendous relationship with the troops that. Uh, that that followed him. They just adored him during the Civil War. Um, you know, he wore a red uh, um, uh, cravat uh, along with some other ostentatious uh, garments, so that his men would always see where he was, especially when he was leading a charge. And the Third Cavalry Division, they all adapted red red cravats. They called themselves the Red Tie Boys, you know, because we're Custer's men, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, you know, it, 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 it's a, it's a, it's, it stands in marked contrast to the relations he had with his 7th Cavalry uh, on the Great Plains after the war. But he was leading, you know, these were volunteers who signed up to save the country. They wanted it done as quickly as possible. Any officer who uh, would lead them in smashing the enemy and, and attaining that result as quickly as possible was okay in their books. Uh, so, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's, Custer is one of these people, and you find them in, in different walks of life, who um, attains spectacular success while still a kid, and and uh, sometimes that could that could that can spoil somebody because the rest of your life may not be as great as, as what you were doing at age twenty three to twenty five. In some ways, I think Custer spent the rest of his life trying to reduplicate the success and the acclaim that he enjoyed during the Civil War. Yeah. Well, you mentioned after the war, and if we go back to the movie, once Custer's out of the military for a short period after the war, but then he's reinstated to military active service and assigned to Fort Lincoln. And in the movie, there's a scene where, you know, while they're traveling there, he's traveling there with his wife. They're raided by the Sioux, and Custer manages to capture Crazy Horse, the Sioux chief. And maybe it's just me, but it seemed like that was a little too convenient the way that the movie portrayed that. <laughs> uh, but then at, they're at the fort and Crazy Horse breaks out with the help of a friend. And then as a result, Custer shuts the bar down at the fort so the soldiers can't drink. Uh, he also shuts down the trading post that's selling rifles to the Native Americans. And we see a montage of Custer training the cavalry. How well did the movie do showing Custer's arrival and kind of whipping people into shape there at Fort Lincoln? There's so much to unpack here. <laughs> Let me begin by saying that Custer and the 7th Cavalry did not arrive at Fort Abraham Lincoln until 1873. So, you know, you've got 65 to 73 that just gets skipped over. Uh, the, war, the Civil War ends. This large temporary army that had been raised to defeat the Confederacy is demobilized. Custer had a temporary rank of major general by the war's end, reverts to his, his permanent rank of captain. 
Now, there was, uh, he may have briefly considered leaving the army because Benito Juarez, uh, who was fighting to drive the French and the Austrian puppet emperor out of, out of Mexico, Maximilian, offered him command of the Mexican cavalry. Uh, but, the, but the army, the U.S. Army, would not give him a leave of absence. You know, if you take this post, then you're, you're out of the army. Custer didn't want to separate from the army. Well, in 1866, while they're, they're getting rid of all these citizen soldiers, they're, they're reorganizing the regular permanent army. They expanded a bit, and they create four new cavalry regiments. Uh, they had the first through sixth uh, during the Civil War, first through sixth U.S. cavalry. Well, they, they now create the seventh through the tenth, and uh, Custer becomes lieutenant colonel of the newly raised 7th Cavalry in 1866. And um, the, the guy who's, there are two people who serve as colonel during the rest of Custer's life. Uh, they're given desk jobs so that Custer is the acting commander of the 7th. And he starts out, he and his regiment start out fighting Indians, not up in the Dakotas, but in the Southern Plains, in Kansas, and what is today Oklahoma. Uh, and he does not get off to a good start. Because fighting Indians was a lot different than fighting Confederates who would form up and, you know, meet you face to face. Indians, if they saw a lot of white soldiers, they'd say, well, we've got a limited population. We're just going to leave these guys alone. We're going to melt away. Uh, we, we can, you know, our horses are quicker and we know where to hide. And we'll attack small detachments or we'll attack stagecoach uh, stations and things like that. So Custer's uh, first summer on the Plains, 1867, he is just going hither and yon. And the men he, he's leading, these aren't guys who had, you know, this definite mission, we've got to save the country. A lot of them were, I need a job. Uh, leading in the Army is hard. Or if I join the Army, I'll get a free trip out to the West that I can desert. Uh, you know, I go to Colorado where there's silver and, and gold fields and things like that. So Custer has, uh, he has this trouble uh, with the 7th Cavalry. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not, uh, well, you know, there's, there's a motivation problem. And as I say, he's got this desertion problem. A lot of the officers, too, um, uh, they're kind of surly because, like Custer, they were all reduced in rank. Uh, some went from brigadier general to captain. You know, Custer was lucky going to lieutenant colonel. Uh, and, and they know this army is so small, it could be 20 years before I get promoted, et cetera. So why should I kill myself? But Custer's gotten ho, we got to do this, we got to do this. And he's pushing, pushing, pushing. And a lot of people decide they just don't like him. And um, he, he kind of reacts to those negative vibes. He becomes this really um, um, heartless martinet. I mean, you don't follow orders that I'm going to do, you know, administer all kinds of punishments and things like that, tie you up by your thumbs, make you stand on a barrel. Uh, he ordered deserters shot without trial at one point when, it, when it, it, the problems got so chronic. And then finally, he su suffers kind of breakdown. He deserts his own command to, to spend time with his wife. He hears that she's at a post where there might be a cholera epidemic and just goes bananas. And he's arrested and court-martialed and uh, found guilty and suspended uh, from, the, from, from rank and pay for a year and returns to Monroe uh, you know, to, to live out his probation. But uh, other Army commanders aren't doing any better against the Indians on the Southern Plains. And Phil Sheridan, who gets put in charge of the Army in the West, he succeeds in shortening Custer's sentence by two months and brings it back and gives Custer a chance to redeem himself. And Custer will do that. He will lead a winter campaign uh, in western Oklahoma, uh, down into the Washington River Valley. He'll attack a Cheyenne village uh, at dawn on November 27, 1868, kill most of the warriors, capture about 50 women and, and children. It's the Army's first victory um, uh, over the Plains Indians since the end of the Civil War. So the Army makes a big thing out of it. See, we are. We really know what we're doing, and it establishes Custer, Custer's reputation, rightly or wrongly, uh, because there were other officers who won more victories. Uh, but it establishes reputation as America's premier Indian fighter. Uh, and afterwards, he pursues different bands and resorts to diplomacy, talks their uh, leaders into coming back to their agencies. Uh, because he's a celebrity, uh, 
rich rich people from the states and and, and, uh, and Great Britain come out and, and they want him to take them on buffalo hunts and things like that, which is a way of making uh, for the army uh, making points with uh, American movers and shakers and, and, and good diplomacy with friendly friendly powers. Uh, but um, while this is going on, uh, of course, uh, the nation is in in in, in the uh, thick of reconstruction after the Civil War. Uh, the radical Republicans tried to, uh, um, well, they tried to implement re- re- regime change on the defeated Confederate states, uh, you know, more or less placed them under Republican state governments, uh, supported by uh, the votes of former slaves. And former Confederates resorted to uh, widespread political terrorism to fight that. An estimated 50,000 politically active blacks will be murdered between 18. Uh, 65 and 1877. And things get so bad that, that Congress passes some what they call force acts, which uh, permits the, the um, uh, inauguration of martial law in certain areas that are under contr- out of control, uh, where you know, the local sheriffs and, and, and judges either can't or won't try to control the Klan. So the 7th Cavalry from 1871 to 73, the, it's scattered through the South. Uh, an anti-terrorist duty, which Custer didn't like. He was he was a Democrat like his father, and he was kind of sympathetic to the former Confederates. Uh, but they're down there until seventy three. Then in seventy three, their 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 problems are mounting now with the Lakota or the Sioux in the Northern Plains, and so the Seventh Cavalry is sent to Fort Abraham Lincoln. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's very different. <laughs> the impression I got from the movie was just like, oh, okay, the war's over, and so he's. Kind of waiting around until he gets something else. <laughs> yeah, well, as I was watching the movie, of course, this is a movie from 1941, and I, I couldn't help but get the sense that there was a, a racial side to this whole story that the movie doesn't really address. The, the closest that I saw the movie kind of admitting race as a driver of what the cavalry was doing was a bit of text. It says, and I'll, I'll read this off as quote, and so was born the immortal seventh U.S. cavalry which cleared the plains for a ruthlessly advancing civilization that spelled doom to the red race, end quote. And the way the movie explained what the 7th Cavalry was supposed to be doing was protecting, and I'll put that in quotes, some 100,000 square miles of territory. And it doesn't really mention this, but by protecting, they're really protecting the white settlers who are moving into Native American territory. So can you give a little more historical context around the role of the cavalry and the racial tensions of the time? Yeah, you know the way the way uh, that phase uh, of Custer's life is depicted. It's like the Battle of Hanover. It's Custer by himself, and now uh, saving the Union, and now it's Custer the Seventh Cavalry uh, protecting a hundred thousand square miles. Well, you know, it wasn't there. There was uh, there were a number of army regiments out there uh, on frontier duty, and of course, uh, you know, they were there to protect white interests, the interests of uh, of the United States government. Uh, the interests of certain stakeholders uh, who had an important voice in, in the economy. And, you know, these are the people who would be the big donors, et cetera, especially the railroads. Um, and uh, so, you know, yeah, I mean, the Army, uh, but, but although it's interesting, um, um, the Army will fight Indians if Indians leave their reservations, you know, if they, if they break the rules. But a lot of army officers are sympathetic to the Indians, saying, you know, if these people were treated decently, they wouldn't go on the war path, and we wouldn't have to go out and kill a bunch of them, and also risk our own necks. Custer, in his autobiography, My Life on the Plains, which he published in 1874, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, if I were an Indian, I would far rather, you know, live uh, the free life in the plains. I'd far rather resist than submit. It's a life on a reservation where, you know, the government cheats you, doesn't give you the food and other amenities, the other annuities that have been promised you in, in treaty. Uh, so there's, um, you know, there's this, this, um, this contradiction there. But, I mean, when Custer was told to fight, then, then, then fight he did. He didn't, he didn't get say, no, I'm a conscientious objector. I want to sit this one, sit this one out. Uh, so, um, yeah, you know, it's... Uh, um, uh, the army's job uh, is to protect American interests. Although the movie, you know, 
uh, they reach a point where Crazy Horse says, well, fight no more. We'll be good. Uh, all we ask is that you let us have the Black Hills. And Custer says, yes, okay, that's fine. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it's, and then the Indians are betrayed, right? You know, they're, 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 they're final resistance that claims Custer's life. Custer doesn't blame them, in effect. You know, he's, uh, he sees that they're, they're, they're being exploited, they're being betrayed. Uh, but um, a- after the war, um, the Army tried to open uh, a, a road into western Montana where there were gold fields that led through lands that the Sioux considered theirs. And the Sioux under Red Cloud uh, f- resisted that, and, and they ended up uh, massacring an uh, army detachment of 80 men outside of Fort Phil Kearney, and the army decided, gee, we just can't cope with these people. We don't have enough enough, enough men. So uh, they negotiate the Treaty of Fort, uh, Fort Laramie, which more or less says that certain lands belong to the Sioux, and that would have included the Black Hills. So that basic agreement was made. Uh, but then in 1874, uh, gold, um, uh, at least the claims are made that, that there's gold in the Black Hills and then uh, the gold rush, the gold rush opens up. And uh, the people that the person that was responsible for those claims was George Armstrong Custer. Uh, when the 7th Cavalry moved uh, to Fort Lincoln, the first job was to protect a survey party from the Northern Pacific Railroad. So a big business interest is building, uh, you know, across uh, the northern part of the country to the Pacific Northwest. But the Indians are objecting and trying to stop them from, um, you know, deciding where to place the rails and bridges, etc. So the 7th Cavalry goes out in the summer of 73. And uh, the Sioux oppose um, this expedition in force. Custer fights uh, two uh, engagements with the Sioux, and he's successful in driving them off. And I think that success caused him to believe, well, I understand the Lakota, I understand the Sioux, I know their bag of tricks. So they, they don't really, they don't intimidate me. Uh, and he may have paid for that three years later. Uh, but the army is, is, is you know, thinks that the, that, the, that the Lakota, you know, they were the most powerful coalition uh, of, of native peoples uh, in the Northern Plains, that they're just, uh, uh, well, they need to be taken down a peg. So Custer sent out in 74 to look for a site to establish a fort in the midst of Sioux country. There are geologists in this, uh, in this expedition, and the geologists claim that they uh, found gold. And, and Custer writes an anonymous uh, newspaper dispatch that says gold is to be found at the very grassroots. You know, it's right on top. You have to dig that deep. Now, the country had plunged into a major depression in 1873. So the cries of gold, you know, elicit a massive response. They would have anyway. Initially, the army is used to try to intercept these people who are trespassing on Sioux land. Uh, The army is used as peacekeepers, but there are just so many. And the interlopers are white. And if if they can't vote because they're living out of uh, where the established states, they got friends and relatives who want to make sure they're, they're safe. And in the end, the Grant administration decides to force the Sioux into war. In the winter of 1875-76, an ultimatum is set out uh, saying that any any, uh, uh, Native peoples, uh, Lakota and also their allies, the Cheyenne, who are are off their reservations by a certain date, they will be considered hostile. In other words, the army will have permission to kill them. And, And this ultimatum is sent out so late in the year that it can't even reach these villages before the deadline expires. So they set up this thing, and and uh, we have the Great Sioux War of 1876, 1877 as a result. And um, the army organizes three columns, converging columns, come at the Indians from three different directions at once. Hopefully one or more will bump into Indians. The Dakota column, mainly the 7th Cavalry, but some other troops, under Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer, uh, the Montana column under uh, uh, Colonel uh, uh, John uh, Gibbon, and then the Wyoming column coming out of the South under General George Brigadier General George Crook. Um, so that's set up. Uh, but Custer gets into trouble. He'll lose command of the Dakota column, which uh, gets alluded to in the movie. From what you were saying, it sounds like the movie fabricated basically that 
the, I'll just say the, the impression I got from the movie was that Custer was blameless in breaking this treaty. Like there's there's a scene where I, I think he's on on a train and he's heading back to Washington and he realizes, oh, what's going on? That oh, there's this gold gold has been found. He realized it was going to happen and he uh, start tries to expose the plan, but nobody l- listens to him and you know he, he ends up seeming pretty blameless. I think uh, the name of the Sharps, like a father son you know business that we're trying to to push this to keep their business. They were the ones that were running the, the trading post. And this plot line would appeal to Americans who have, have come through the Great Depression, right? Because who do you blame for the Great Depression? All those stinking selfish capitalists that destroyed the economy, right? So the bad guys aren't going to be Custer. It's going to be these business guys who are willing to sacrifice people, you know, lure these people into the Black Hills where they'll be murdered by the Indians just so they can create more business opportunities for themselves. According to the movie, his with his career is kind of Custer's career is kind of in in jeopardy there, and he takes it he plea makes a plea to now President Grant to try to get reinstated and try to join his regiment to fight the Sioux on what's looking to be a suicide mission. Is the movie right to imply that Custer knew that he would going to die at Little Bighorn, but he still went out of his way to try to make sure that he would be there with his men? Custer didn't have a suicide wish. What happens is that uh, Custer, um, he sticks his nose into politics when he shouldn't. Uh, you know, he's a Democrat, and that's one reason why he remained a lieutenant colonel for the last uh, 10 years of his life. Uh, that was part of it. Uh, but the Grant administration, the Ulysses S. Grant administration, you know, it's famous for, for widespread corruption. Uh, President Grant himself, uh, there's no evidence he was dishonest, but he had a bad, a bad uh, habit of appointing people to high office, cabinet posts, who turned out to be crooks. Uh, and his Secretary of War, Beltbap, uh, is in trouble because uh, he uh, uh, was in charge of awarding uh, post sutler ships, you know, the Sharp Store, where the troops could buy liquor and other things. Well, uh, you know. There was corruption there. And, you know, if you paid uh, Secretary Belknap uh, a certain premium and then gave him kickbacks, you'd get that contract. And the troops were told you could only shop in these stores. You can't go into nearby Bismarck and get things, you know, at a cheaper price. And uh, uh, because the, the, these, um, the, these crooked uh, sutlers were, you know, paying extra money uh, to get their licenses, they were hiking their prices. So uh, Belknap's being investigated. There's a congressional probe that was known as the Climber Commission. And Custer uh, is heard saying some things uh, about uh, this corruption. And so he gets subpoenaed <laughs> to, to do it on the record. And uh, so he is criticizing uh, the Grant administration. I mean, Grant was honest, but he, 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 he stood by dishonest trends longer than he should have. You know, instead of going after them, he'd go after the whistleblowers. But Custer also implicated his brother Orville, Orville Grant, in some of these dealings. So he's not only not only uh, 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 sullying the reputation of Grant's administration, but he's also going after a member of Grant's family. So Grant says, Custer can't go after the Sioux. You know, put him under arrest. Keep him. And that creates something of a furor. The, the Democratic press, of course, says he's persecuting an honest soldier. Uh, and, and letters are coming to the West, to, to the White House. How can you keep Custer, uh, our greatest Indian fighter, out of what's going to be the biggest Indian war ever? Uh, Custer's department commander, Alfred uh, Terry, intercedes on Custer's behalf. Sheridan does to a certain extent. And Custer writes a letter to Grant. He doesn't burst into, into the White House, but he sends Grant a letter that pretty much uh, expresses what Errol Flynn says to, to Grant in the movie. He said, you know, uh, uh, spare me the humiliation of seeing my regiment ride out against the enemy and me not to share their privations and dangers. And so Grant says, okay, you can go, but not in command. Terry, you got to leave your comfortable headquarters in St. Paul. You're in charge of the Dakota Column and make sure we keep Custer on a tight leash. <laughs> and so Custer goes in as second in command of that, ex- of that expedition under General Terry. Okay. Okay. A letter makes a lot more sense than in the movie we see Custer basically walking into the Oval Office and <laughs> yeah, again, that's like you know, it's like punching out a superior officer. I just 
it's exciting filmmaking perhaps, but no, yeah, no, yeah. Well, in the movie, we don't really see Custer dying at Little Bighorn, but it's definitely talked about, and it's clear that he does, along with everyone in his command. And as I was watching the movie, the thing that came to mind was how we saw Davy Crockett keep, just keep fighting until the end of the 1955 Disney movie, you know, King of the Wild Frontier. Uh, this time, it's Custer who seems to be the last one alive while everyone around him is dying. How well did the movie do showing Custer's last stand? Well, you know, again, it simplifies things. I mean, Custer and his entire regiment go riding around, then they see the Indians, they go riding toward them, and then they realize, boy, they're a heck of a lot of Indians, so we better get off our horses, just kind of form a, a, a shapeless mob and shoot at the Indians and, 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 and die fighting. Uh, in reality, uh, Custer, with about uh, 650 uh, soldiers, and scouts, um, they, 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 they are following a trail. Uh, starting on June 22nd, that will eventually lead them to the Little Bighorn Valley. Uh, the, the, the faulty intelligence available to the Army inclines Custer to believe, in fact, he tells his officers, on the night of the 22nd, we can expect 800 to 1,000 Indians. And surely our regiment can handle that many. But the trail gets wider as they follow it, because more Indians are coming in and joining Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse. But it leads them to the Little Bighorn, and Custer decides, well, you know, he, he had separated from Terry. Terry's coming down from the north. He's supposed to be swinging Custer south of the Indians. You know, I'll, I'll wait a day. I'll wait till the morning of the 26th and attack the Indians then. That will give Terry time to come in from the north with five troops of cavalry and, and about you know, seven companies of infantry and two Gatling guns. Uh, but um, on the morning of the 25th, uh, he, he is informed that his regiment has been spotted by some Sioux who were just out, you know, probably hunting or something like that. And he says, well, they're going to ride to the village and they're going to inform their friends that there are a lot of white soldiers. And what the Indians do when there are a lot of white soldiers is that they take off. You know, we don't want to suffer heavy casualties, even when we have a chance of winning. We want to, you know, uh, live to fight another day and, and do it on, on terms of our own choosing. So he uh, uh, rides into the valley of the Little Bighorn. He has 12 companies of cavalry. He sends three companies to the south to make sure the Indians aren't trying to escape in that direction. And then uh, one of his uh, interpreters sees uh, about 40 Indians riding away from Custer's column, the approach, and says, there go your Indians running like devils. So Custer orders Major Marcus Reed and three companies to cross the river and charge the village, wherever it is. Not quite sure, but, you know. They're in that area somewhere. So cross the river, head north, and when you see Indians, charge them. And then Custer, instead of following Reno, he will swing north on the other side of the Little Bighorn, the east side of Little Bighorn. And, and people think, well, he was just trying to find a way to flank the Indians. Uh, but everything falls apart. Reno runs into tons of uh, uh, Lakota and Cheyenne warriors who are not in the mood to run. You know, they reach this point, these people, they've been pushed around so much. Uh, that they thought, this is our last year of freedom. This is our last year where we could be real Indians. Instead of run away to fight again another day, uh, the battle cry is, it's a good day to die. If you got to go out, go out like a real Indian. And also, the whites had surprised them. Those, those Indians that had spotted Custer's regiment early on didn't report back to the village. So there's this village with thousands of women and children. And these Indians... We're not going to let these white soldiers hurt our loved ones. We're going to wipe them out. So they rout Reno, and they kill about a quarter of his men. But he's able to, by leading a panicky retreat, get to the other side of the river. Custer, though, has continued northward. And we're not exactly sure what he tried to do. He probably tried to stay on the offensive too long. He was hoping that Captain Benteen would come up with a reserve ammunition and send a couple of couriers to Benteen. But Benteen didn't move that quickly. And um, in the course of a two-hour engagement, Custer and his five companies are whittled down by Indians fighting from cover, not riding around in circles like, look, look what a good target I am, shoot me, white man. You know, they're sniping. Uh, and then they'll overrun decimated you know, segments uh, 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 of Custer's command. And they, they, they destroy um, Custer and the 210 officers and men under his immediate command. Uh, Custer is found at the top of a hogback ridge, which was probably one of the last positions that the soldiers held. Um, they found uh, he had a 
instead of an uh, army issue rifle, he had a Remington hunting rifle and they found some of the cartridges from that rifle uh, under his body. So he was alive when he got there. Uh, how long he remained alive, we don't know. Um, but, you know, um, we don't know who, who the last was to fall. Uh, the Indians weren't standing, standing up. So who could I identify, you know, and, you know, making good targets of themselves? They wouldn't have known him anyway um, uh, if they'd seen him, uh, especially since he'd been on the, in the field and had a beard, you know, and was covered with dust, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, he, he, he was probably, you know, he probably lasted uh, most of the battle before, before he went, before he went down. He was hit with a bullet uh, in, I believe, the, 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 the breast, uh, and one in the temple, either one of them, one could have killed him. Something that I saw in the movie that kind of threw me off a little bit, because <laughs> one of the first things that, that we see Custer do is to tell his men to fight on foot. But then earlier in the movie, he had said that, you know, the cavalry has a much better chance than the infantry. So why would the cavalry just immediately get off their horses? Doesn't that basically... Oh, no, who knows? Uh, you know, uh, it's a cavalry job. So, so here's the Indians will be infantry. And again, they're not deployed in any military formation. They're just this mass, and they're all firing at once. I mean, they're guys close to Custer, and, and this, this circle was like maybe 20 guys deep. So how do you miss the guys that are between you and the Indians while you're blazing away? I mean, uh, what we do know from the archaeological evidence is that in certain places, Custer's troopers formed skirmish lines. Um, you know, um, uh, um, these were these were uh, open order lines and uh, and blazed away a, a, at the Indians until those positions were, were compromised and, and overrun. But, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a it's a cavalry job because cavalry has a better chance of pursuing and catching mounted Indians. But, you know, that, uh, uh, but um, I mean, they. they the Indians don't run away, so it's not, you know. It's, and he knows they're not running away, according to the script scenario. They're there for their for their last stand. So yeah, there's a disconnect there between uh, what the script says and, and military tactics. Uh, according to General Sheridan in the movie, if it weren't for Custer's Seventh Cavalry sacrificing themselves, then Terry's force would have been wiped out, the squatters massacred, and the entire frontier overrun. And as for Custer himself, he sent a letter. Uh, dying man's declaration that proves the whole peace treaty conspiracy was true. A tape is forced to resign and the company is dissolved and so on. How well does the movie do showing the aftermath of Custer's death? Pure, pure fiction, uh, pure fiction. Uh, the seventh cavalry lost about 265 uh, personnel killed at the little big horn. So there were people killed in addition to the, the 210 men who died with Custer. Uh, most, most of the other dead were with Reno. Um, Indian casualties were uh, dead at least, were about at least 50. But, I mean, it wasn't like the, the, the Indians suffered. Uh, it, it, it wasn't a fear of victory for them. Uh, what happened afterwards, though, was that the, the, the Indians decided, we can't feed this mass of people if we stay together. You know, there are no Seven Elevens out there. You had, to, you had to hunt your own food, and so they will they will break away. They'll they will splinter, and that will make it easier for the army, which will flood the area with troops, to hunt them down. Uh, so, I mean, the Grant administration and, and the uh, um, the business interests that the Grant administration was serving, um, they, they're not held responsible. Well, I mean, Grant is because he's president, but it's. The the, the 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 main reaction was avenge Custer, you know the Indians get the Indians they're they're they kill those savages you know Sitting Bull and all his his friends so uh, you know the the Indians uh, their their uh, their victory makes uh, uh, enhances their their uh, status as targets and the army will keep after them Crook and Terry uh, chase after them. With, not that much success, but other abler commanders like Nelson Miles, and uh, they'll keep doing it in the wintertime, uh, which is rough on the Indians because their horses, their ponies are grass fed. Uh, and uh, when, when the snow and ice covers the, the grass, which uh, if there's any grass left at the end of the summer, it's burned out. It's not that nutritious. They, they really can't 
they can't feed them. And wintertime is when they, they kind of hole up and they live off the dried buffalo meat that they've gathered uh, in the warmer months, et cetera. But they're not allowed to do that because the soldiers are after them. The buffalo coats, as they call them, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're just tramping uh, through the winter wastes. And, and so these Indians, uh, they either get uh, tracked down and attacked uh, and, and then the survivors surrender or, or other people say, you know, our kids are dying. Our old people are dying. Um, we, we can't keep this up. Better to live on the reservation than to watch the slow death of our families. Um, so, uh, you know, if Sitting Bull flees into, into, into Canada uh, and he'll come back later uh, to live on a reservation. Even Crazy Horse ends up surrendering. Uh, and then he, he's killed in an altercation. He gets a bayonet through a kidney because the uh, army thinks he's plotting a revolt. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's, these people are beaten into the ground. So, so Anthony Quinn uh, maybe wasn't as dramatic a, a, as he conveyed it. But yeah, it was. Uh, you know, Custer's defeat was also, also ensured the conquest of, of those Indian patriots. Well, the movie doesn't really mention this, but I, I was always under the impression that it was was Custer's wife who kind of helped secure his legacy after death. What you're saying here almost sounds like there were there may have been some other parts of it too, as far as the military is concerned. She will write three books about their life together in the West, and in those books, he is the 19th century American of a knight errant. He's good, gallant, brave. Um, his motives are always the purest. He's, you know, he's a, um, a considerate and loving husband in all things, and just being in his in his presence is 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 a pleasure. I mean, you get some glimpses of Victorian sexuality. She'll comment about narrow waists and broad shoulders and things like that. So she dug his body, uh, which comes across in their private correspondence. They they had a, a pretty healthy sex life, uh, you know, uh, but. Uh, yeah, Libby will, will will become his press agent, and so the custom you see, and they die with their boots on. That that's her her vision of George Armstrong Custer. She also went after uh, the two senior officers in the Seventh Cavalry, Major Reno and Captain Venting, claiming that they deliberately abandoned her husband, that they wouldn't go to his rescue, and the Army will hold a court of inquiry, in which those officers will be found or will be clear. But it's interesting, within a few years, each one gets kicked out of the army on morals charges. Major Reno is accused of being a peeping Tom looking through the window at his colonel's daughter as she's getting dressed. And Benteen is accused of getting drunk and exposing himself to urinate outside of a sutler's store. So you know, it's, it's, I get this sense that the army just waited until no one was looking and then it kind of handled the situation. Yeah, especially what you're saying. I mean, granted, a different scenario, but what you're saying earlier when Custer was at West Point, it's a lot, having a lot of things just kind of shoved under the rug. But then here it sounds like, OK, well, now we could we could come up with excuses to get rid of some people. <laughs> Almost the opposite. Yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, uh, in institutions, whether whether someone's right or wrong, if 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 having them around causes trouble, then you get rid of them. You know, Certain people are sacrificed for the the institution's needs. The movie seems to make a point to mention a song called Gary Owen. Uh, was that actually a song that the seventh cavalry performed? Like we see them doing the movie. Definitely. Gary Owen, um, uh, was an Irish drinking song. It originated in the, uh, the 1780s. I think Gary Owen is a suburb of, of Dublin. It's about, you know, just going out getting drunk and beating people up and smashing windows Having you know, and, and, uh, instead of uh, spa meaning water, we'll drink brown ale and pay the reckoning on the nail. Um, and um, but it was a rocking tune, and it, it became popular uh, uh, with Wellington's British regiments during the Napoleonic Wars. And it uh, pops up then on uh, in, in the band books of uh, Union Army uh, regimental bands during the Civil War. So Custer undoubtedly heard it. During the Civil War, it's interesting. During the Civil War, his favorite, his fighting song was "Yankee Doodle." One of his officers wrote, "Whatever our old brigade band sounded, Yankee Doodle, every man's hand went to his saber, because it was all, always a signal for a charge." But he uh, uh, he picks a new one for the Seventh Cavalry, and when he won his first big Indian victory at the Battle of Washington, 
attacking at dawn, he had the 7th Cavalry Regimental Band with him. And to signal the charge, instead of a bugle blowing the charge, the bandmaster was told, sound Gary Owen. And so they're playing Gary Owen on his brass instruments. They didn't play that much of it because the band, bandsman's saliva froze. But if they, they got enough notes out to get the attack going. Okay. And uh, Arthur Penn in, in Little Big Man will show a fife and drum band playing Gary Owen when Custer attacks the Indians at the Washington. Today, we are talking about a movie that was made in 1941. But if a movie about Custer was made today in 2022, what do you think some of the differences would be in how his life is portrayed? Well, you know, there would be greater consciousness uh, regarding uh, the Indian side of the story. In in the early 1990s, I think 1991, ABC did a two-part miniseries called Son of the Morning Star which was based on a best-selling book by Evan Cannell. And that movie attempted to, well, it's sympathetic to the Indians. It's sympathetic to the Indians. Uh, Custer, in fact, comes across as kind of a a surly kind of guy, just driven by his ambition, does care a bit about his family, is in love with his wife, etc. But he's, he's not as attractive a character as the other main lead. Crazy Horse, played by Rodney A. Grant. Uh, and I imagine that even today, uh, that uh, if a film was made about the Little Bighorn uh, or about Custer's life, uh, Custer wouldn't fare, fare as well as some Indian Indian figures, uh, which is too bad because there were two sides to the guy. Uh, there were people who were willing to go to their death uh, with him, and there were other people, uh, again, the 7th Cavalry, but you read memoirs and diaries and letters, about half the people who serve under him love him and half hate him. <laughs> and being able to try to capture that and find an actor who could show you both sides of a man who could, who could inspire uh, those diametrically opposed reactions, that would be a challenge for a scriptwriter, and that would be a challenge for an actor. Well, let's say that you were in charge of that. What would be one of the things that you would leave? Like, what would be one of the things that you would change about that? Well, um, well, as I say, I, I would try to uh, see if we could, uh, if we we, we we could capture that uh, that seeming contradiction uh, mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, but also, you know. Um, you know, Custer's an Indian fighter. That, that's how he's cast. But he also fought for Indians. Uh, the Lakota, one reason that they were powerful was because they were able to take land and resources from their neighbors. And uh, uh, the whites, whenever they went into battle, they had a large number of Indians fighting on their side. The tribes that had been uh, vanquished uh, by the Indians they were fighting. I mean, they were able to constantly do a kind of divide and conquer. Uh, strategy uh, throughout the Indian Wars. But when Custer goes into the Valley of the Little Bighorn, he has uh, uh, 35 Indian scouts. Uh, and, and their job is not just to say, look, there are other Indians. They're there to fight. Uh, uh, most of them were Arikara or Rees, as the whites called them, and the others were Crow. And it's interesting, the land on which the Valley of the Little Bighorn was fought, that was traditionally Crow territory. In fact, today, that's the Crow agency. Uh, they, they have these big uh, Custer's Last Stand reenactments uh, each year, uh, and they bring in white cavalry reenactors and they use local Indian talent. The local Indian talent, though, are the descendants of the Indians who fought on Custer's side. But in the reenactment, they're playing the Sioux because it's good business, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, uh, uh, trying to bring in that kind of subtlety that there's this, it's, it's not just white versus red. Um, I think that would, uh, that would be, um, I think that would be helpful as well. A more complex story. Yeah, a more complex story. Thank you so much for coming on to chat about They Died With Their Boots On. For someone listening to this who wants to learn more about your work, can you share a bit about your books and where they can get them? This film, as much as anything, is the reason why I became a historian. And so it's no coincidence that my first book, Custer Victorious, The Civil War Battles of General George Armstrong Custer, uh, you know, uh, that, that that was my first book. I didn't see that very well, but uh, because I had this this Custer fascination, and it's still still in print, still selling. 
in, in paperback so people can find it at uh, Amazon.com uh, or wherever else uh, books are sold. I've done, done other books um, uh, that, about Custer that, that are out of print, but I, you know, kind of maintain this interest in Last Stands. That's one, one of the things that led me to Wake Island. And I, I wrote a couple of books about the the Marine uh, stand at, at Wake in 1941. Uh, the one about the battle is called Facing Fearful Odds. And it's kind of interesting because the, the script for Wake Island resembles they died with their boots on. At the end, the Marines are all showing, uh, are, are shown, the Marines are all, all shown fighting to the death. Uh, and they're being you know, wiped out by hordes of Japanese, just like Custer the Seventh were wiped out by hordes of Lakota. And, and the movies were, um, uh, you know, cast that way to, uh, Inspire patriotism, and you know, inspire Americans to you know, uh, you know, step forward and put on your country's uniform and make the sacrifices necessary for victory. Uh, in fact, they died with their boots on. Uh, came out, oh, um, 1934, seven years after the book that turned Custer's image inside out was published. Frederick Vanderwater published a book called Glory Hunt, which depicted Custer as an unprincipled. Um, ambition-driven, uh, self-absorbed villain who was willing to sacrifice friend or foe to move up in rank, to get more attention, etc. And that book was a bestseller. Uh, and, and it was affecting the way people looked at Custer. But when Warner Brothers uh, decided to make this movie, they said, well, you know, we got a war coming on. <laughs> uh, it would be unpatriotic, you know, to, to make any army officer look that bad. So the Libby Custer version uh, was uh, presented to the public uh, in that film, and it helped to perpetuate for a while the positive vision of Custer. But that would soon that would soon fade in the fifties and and the sixties. I like the comparison that you made of Wake Island, which of course you know we talked about that movie too, which came out. I think Wake Island came out in nineteen forty two, right? Which would have been you know right after this. So very heavy on both very heavy on the propaganda side with World War Two. And Americans willingly sacrificing themselves to buy time, uh, so that their countrymen can, will be ready to will be ready to prevail. So they, that's uh, the, 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 this last stand theme. It, it, it's been a powerful current in, in Western literature, going back to the Song of Rome. And uh, I imagine, uh, well, we still see that. We see uh, films about uh, doomed uh, uh, outposts or, or patrols in, in Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, and it's, there's still that last damn quality there. Well, thank you again so much for your time and, and chatting about this. I had a lot of fun. Same here. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan Lefeb. I'd like to thank Gregory J.W. Irwin for sharing his expertise about the historical accuracy of 1941's They Died With Their Boots On. If you want to learn more about Custer, I would highly recommend Gregory's book called Custer Victorious, The Civil War Battles of General George Armstrong Custer. And don't forget, you can hear more from Gregory in a couple previous episodes of Based on a True Story when he joined us to chat about the movie Wake Island, as well as the movie Glory. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Custer's promotion to general during the Civil War came as a surprise. Number two, Custer was not a model student at West Point. Number three, Custer commanded the 7th Cavalry during the Civil War. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number one. Custer's promotion to general during the Civil War came as a surprise. That's true. Gregory explained that the movie was correct to suggest that Custer's promotion to general came as a surprise to him and many others. But he also pointed out the movie was wrong to suggest that it was an accident. Let's bounce around a bit to get to number three next. Custer commanded the 7th Cavalry during the Civil War. That's the lie. As we learned, during the Civil War, there was the 1st through 6th Cavalry, but it wasn't until after the war that the 7th through 10th Cavalry was raised and Custer was given the command of the 7th. 
That means number two is also true. Custer was not a model student at West Point. Gregory told us that Custer basically believed there were two positions worth having in class, first place or last place. And since he wasn't inclined to work hard enough to attain the top of the class, he tried to stay as close to the bottom of the class as he could without being kicked out. In fact, as Gregory pointed out, Custer admitted that he was not a role model during his career at West Point. Last but not least, it's time now to let you know how long it took to create this episode. If you're a longtime listener to the podcast, you'll know that I like to share this information just to help you appreciate all the podcasts that you listen to. After all, a huge majority of podcasts out there are like mine, completely free to listen to, but that does not mean they're free to create. Quite the opposite. They can cost quite a bit of money, and almost every podcast out there has higher costs than money. They have high costs in time. The time it takes to learn the technical side, to research the episodes, to record them, to edit them, and so on. But I only have the stats for my own show, so with that in mind, today's episode took me 39 hours to create. To make it clear, that's only my time. Gregory has spent years researching and gathering his expertise, so obviously it does not include any of that time. And to be a little more specific, even that time of mine doesn't even include all of my time because that 39 hours is only the time that it took for me to produce this one episode. It doesn't include all the time that I spend building and maintaining the Based on a True Story website, finding new guests and scheduling and the logistics of all that, the email newsletter, social media, and all those things that don't have anything to do with making today's episode, but are still things that are required to make the podcast overall. In a nutshell, This podcast may be free to listen to, but it's not free to create. And that's why I'm so thankful for the sponsors whose ads you've heard on this episode. You can find more about them over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash advertisers. But they're not the only ones helping to keep the show alive. There are wonderful people just like you who are helping to keep this show financially going. So if you found value in today's episode, and if you're using a Podcast 2.0 app, I'd really appreciate it if you boost now. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed today's episode enough to share it with a friend and maybe even consider helping to support the next episode over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Once again, that's basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash support. Until next time, thanks so much for listening and I'll chat with you again really soon.